I am Dennis the Professor. And today, we're going to look at a couple of interesting things. So, the first thing we want to look at today is current events in business. Now, there's a couple of reasons why we do this, right? So I do a current events section every day. I do it in my class. Um, and the reason is, unless you are fully immersed in business and completely applying yourself every single time, you're probably not going out and getting a lot of this information yourself, right? So I think that it's my responsibility to help you get that information. Oh, excuse me, there you go. All right, I think that it's my responsibility to help you get that information, right? So. We do current events so that we can think about the world at large, right? And let's discuss for a moment why it is that we even do these classes, right? The reason that we do these classes is that my goal is to provide you with tools that you need to succeed. And there goes my chalk. Regardless of whether or not you're an engineering major or looking to start a business or a finance major looking to refresh what they're doing or have never gone to college at all and are looking to simply learn about business, my goal is to give you the tools because business is changing constantly, right? Nothing that I give you will be 100% applicable, but if you have the tools, if you understand what's going on, you can use it. And the reason we look at current events is so that we can try to apply what we're learning to what's going on in the world, right? So we'll keep the current events section relatively short for now. In the future, we'll be going into more depth as we learn more and more, right? So GM, major car manufacturer, has recalled one million vehicles. Right? This is obviously not great for GM. Recalling one million vehicles is no small deal, and having to fix all of them isn't either. But what we know is this is an electronics problem, an electronics and software problem. Now, we can safely assume that over time this will get better. But what we're seeing is that GM, a company that predominantly specializes not in producing great electronics and great software, is not great at producing great electronics and great software. And so, more than likely, in the future, we'll start seeing a disaggregation of this kind of business, right? So GM will, instead of doing their own electronics and software, will contract it out to a third party, right? And that's what's happening, that's the general trend in business at this time, and a trend that we're likely to see continue, right? So it's something to keep in mind. In the future, we can look into exactly how much a million car recall costs and how they make that decision, and why they make that decision strategically, and what's happened to companies like Volvo that have decided to not make that decision, right? The next thing is OPEC, which is the alliance of countries that produce oil, production has surged. Production surges. Now this wouldn't really be news if we didn't know that Iran was currently under sanctions. And we discussed this in a previous news segment, but basically Iran has been circumventing sanctions with an investment company owned by the government. And so they started a $5 billion fund to circumvent the sanctions. Now, this is just another step in the cat and mouse warfare game of sanctions, right? You impose sanctions, we figure out how to get past them. Okay, and that's something else to consider. If sanctions are becoming less effective, then sanctions are going to become more drastic. Eventually, sanctions will cease to be an effective means of punishing countries, and that will be an interesting development in the economy. So that's the next piece. Besides that, retailers are always very concerned with the holiday season. Right? Retailers do as much as 40 to 50 percent of their sales during the holiday season. Right? So for the holidays, Many retailers are taking a different approach. So retailers used to compete on price or offering. The reality, those modes of competition are dead. It's cheapest to buy it online, 
You can buy just about everything online, right? So it's hard for them to have exclusive products. So what they're doing is they're playing to their advantage and they're offering perks. Now perks in retail used to be pretty lackluster, right? And the reason perks used to be pretty lackluster is that people took a general, very straightforward approach to perks. Basically, you buy something for $10 and the next time you come back, we'll give you a dollar, okay? So it's the effect of getting 1% off, but you get to spend your dollar the next time you're there and not right now. Instead, what they're offering is for their biggest spenders, they are now offering things like dinners with clothing designers, right? Um, or meetings with big distributors, right? Things that they can exclusively offer, right? If you spend a lot of money on Amazon, do you get to go and sit down with a designer of, well, let's say like Marc Jacobs coats? No, right? You don't get to do that. But a retailer like Nordstrom is able to do that. And so they are playing to their competitive advantage, right? Which is going to be a good sign. We'll see how well it works during the holiday season. And it's important to remember that although this can move the needle, it's not going to be the deciding factor. The deciding factor is how much people decide to spend on the holidays. But we'll see if this moves the needle and the way we'll see it, right, is we won't be able to observe it immediately. We'll be able to look at the next holiday cycle and see if retailers retain these perks. If they work, they will keep them. And importantly, they're actually pretty cheap, right? They're cheap to, to provide. Finally, we usually have some foreign country doing something. In this case, it's China. And in this case, it's actually China's middle class. Right? So China's middle class is growing. And it's growing rapidly. And what that means is that people have more spending money. People have more savings. But people also have less time. Right? If you're earning more money, you're probably working more. Right? You're working more efficiently. You're working more effectively. You're leveraging more technology. But you're spending more time at work. And if you're spending more time at work, you're going to demand more conveniences, right? You're going to demand more conveniences. Now, for most people, the majority of your time spent outside of work is spent on things like leisure, right? Spend time relaxing, watching Netflix, playing games, whatever it is, right? That's leisure. It's also spent on personal maintenance. And personal maintenance includes two major pieces, right? Your first major piece is going to be hygiene and appearance, right? Hygiene and appearance. And this requires you to shower on a pretty regular basis and brush your teeth and cut your hair and shave your face and whatever it is you need to do. But the second thing is sustenance, or put more simply, eating and drinking, right? Now, nobody has the time to go and cook meals, right? Is this a good thing or a bad thing? That's for you to decide, but people don't have the time to cook meals, right? That's what we're seeing amongst people, especially people that recently get to the middle class, right? They don't have the time to cook meals because the reason they've gone from a lower class situation to uh, a middle class situation is their country has provided them some opportunity, they've taken advantage of that opportunity, and therefore they've invested a large amount of time to get there, right? So what we're seeing actually out of China, and I'm gonna erase this for a second, and we're gonna focus on the sustenance piece, is in China there was a startup. And this startup did effectively the following. It took the ideas of Grubhub, and food delivery, right? And they said, okay, we can do food delivery. And then it said, okay, well, people are having trouble deciding what to eat, right? So maybe we should implement ratings, right? So let me actually write that differently. So then they decided to implement ratings. Now they looked around the world and because they're not the first to invent the system, they looked at the most effective and most successful system, right? And so they pulled it from Yelp. And then they said, well, you know what? People that recently made money, they still have 
this attitude that they need to save, right? Everybody has this attitude you need to save. You don't want to overpay for things. You really want a good deal, right? And that's true of just about everyone. Just about everyone tries to get a better deal on what they're getting, right? And so what they did is they also added elements of Groupon, right? Where by subscribing or by having regular purchases or so on and so forth, you get coupons and discounts. And so they combined what are essentially three separate companies in the United States into one thing, right? So this is an important thing to look at from two perspectives. First of all, the company was able to raise $5.3 billion, right? On the Hong Kong stock market with its IPO. So they IPO, they sold pieces of the company to the investors and they were able to raise 5.3 billion. This put the company valuation a little above 55 billion in valuation, right? Which means we can see they sold a little bit less than about, or approximately 10% of their company for 5.3 billion, right? So it's very highly valued when it's put together. Now, if we're seeing abroad that these three elements work well together and produce additional synergy on top of existing independently, I mean, imagine if you could get on Yelp, order your food, and then get a discount from the retailer for your food all in one app instead of having to open three. So, you know, right now you have to get on Grubhub, you have to see what's near you. Then you get on Yelp and you look for ratings. Then you might get on Groupon or some other coupon site and look for coupons, right? And so what we can say with some confidence is that their success is an early sign that we will see these companies merging over time, right? Either merging or now they could merge because they see the success and they decide that working together, one plus one equals more than two. Or what they could do is a competitor may emerge that combines all three of these, that pressures these companies into joining forces in order to keep competing, right? And that's China's middle class, right? There was also an interesting article about how uh, the new iPhone caters to the Chinese audience with its dual SIM and larger screen and so on and so forth, and that's going to be an important market, right? So the reason the Chinese iPhone market is important is iPhones in China. The reason the market is important is China has a lot of people. China has a lot of people, right? China also has a lot of domestic phone companies. There's it's ripe with competition, but access to the Chinese markets access to China has been limited, right? Many American companies have a great deal of trying and difficulty getting into the Chinese market. And the reason is they are fundamentally a different consumer, right? They prioritize differently. They have different values and that's to be expected. They're from a different place, right? They've grown up with different, different attitudes towards things, right? And over time, perhaps we'll see greater emergence of a combination but it's a difficult market to get to. In fact, it's so difficult that an entire gray market has emerged. And if you're ever in New York, you can see people that look like they can't afford extremely expensive things, shopping at extremely expensive stores and buying things like perfumes for thousands of dollars or hundreds of dollars, right? Buying it in bulk. And the reason they're buying it in bulk is because those companies have difficulty exporting to China, but Chinese consumers are willing to pay the premium of having someone physically buy it here and send it over. And this is a multi-billion dollar industry. It's worth something like $11 billion, right? So the opportunities are limited. And so iPhones or Apple's need to compete in that market and their ability to compete in that market is going to be very important. Right? And that may be why they're tailoring their newer phones towards the Chinese market, which makes a lot of sense. They've pretty much saturated all of their customers in the United States. There's not many people that don't have smartphones, and those that don't are going to make their decision based on various things, right? But they're not, they're not necessarily going to say, well, iPhone's the best, let's go, or Android's the best. They're going to make the decision based on what's important to them. So that factor of prestige in China makes a lot of sense. So that's our current events section. 
Okay. That is our current events section. Current events is rather short today. Again, there's not always a lot of news. Give me just one second. I'm going to switch over here. All right. So today, today we're going to begin doing something new. And the new thing that we start working on today is called business strategy. Now, business strategy is actually a very interesting topic because, as many of you might know, right, if you play different strategy games, strategy can often decide the victor regardless of the strength of forces or resources, right? So somebody, you could have less resources and still be successful due to superior strategy. Um, you could have less time. You could have some other disadvantage or be going up against someone with a strong advantage and still and still make out on top because you've applied a very good strategy to what you're doing. So that's business strategy. And today we'll be covering a general introduction, right? So I'm actually gonna move the business strategy so that we have more use of the board over to this board right here. There we go. So we're doing business strategy. And we're going to be covering the introduction. So our goal today is to learn why we should study business strategy, how we're going to apply it, and what examples from real life context we can use to try to understand what we're doing. Right. So the first thing we need to understand is that strategy is fundamental to success. Right. If you wish to succeed in business, you can get lucky. Right. So there's two components. Success is made up of luck and strategy. Luck is an ongoing thing. Right. It's something that you have no control over. Right. What you do have control over is actually putting yourself in the situation where luck either doesn't damage you too much or allows you to jump forward, depending on the amount of risk you're willing to take. Right. So whenever you think about strategy, it's important to remember that there's two factors to strategy. Right. The two factors to strategy that are most important are the following. Whenever you are making a decision, there are going to be multiple decisions that you can make in that moment, multiple things that you can prioritize, right? Once you've made the decision, there are going to be multiple ways to implement it. And so strategy deals with both looking at your choices for decisions and selecting the best one for your outcomes or desired outcomes, and then deciding how to implement that strategy in a way that maximizes the opportunity to succeed. So importantly, because this is largely a business lecture, right, and because strategy can be studied in a lot of different ways, we will be looking at strategy, we will be looking at strategy predominantly through the eyes of economics. Now there's obviously di different ways that you could look at strategy there, right? So um, the reason we're looking to at it through economics is we want to try to understand why companies, company decisions, so why they make their decisions, right? And then we want to try to use this to get a better general grasp of strategy and how it can be applied. That doesn't mean we won't be covering other aspects of strategy, but economics will be the driving force in the strategy that we cover. Right? And so by understanding why companies or governments even make certain decisions from an economic standpoint, we will better understand how strategy works. And one of the major facets is, of course, driven by economics. 
right? So some of the questions that you could ask yourself when you're thinking about these decisions, right, is, are questions that, like the following, right? So why is Apple, why is Apple increasing prices? Right? Here we're working backwards, right? We're saying, okay, we don't understand the strategy of Apple. What we do understand is we see their actions at this time. So maybe we can work backwards and understand it, right? Another question would be, why didn't Google, Google buy Twitch? Buy Twitch, right? Twitch, yeah. Why didn't Google buy Twitch, right? Why did it go to Amazon, right? And so here's another thing that we can highlight. It's also important when a company doesn't do something, right? This might be because of some competitive opportunity which helps us learn about the industry. This might be because of some regulation, right? In this case, there was fear of antitrust. But the reason why a company doesn't do something is almost just as important because what does that tell us about Google? If Google is concerned about flagging antitrust regulations, right, and getting involved with that by acquiring yet another major piece of internet media, right, like YouTube and combining that and adding that to Twitch, that means they're afraid of regulation, right? That's a major worry for them. They consider that a major risk. The next thing is why are telecommunications companies, or why are regulators, more, more correctly, why are regulators turning a blind eye to telecom mergers, right? So we've seen a flurry of this happen recently, right? And this is a situation where we can look at what's happening in business, right? But the decision makers in this case are regulators. And so the factors that we have to look at are more macro based, right? They're based on larger decisions. They're based more on the industry than the specific mergers. Right? And then finally, and this is a particular joy of mine to explain, is, is price matching, price matching good for consumers? Is price matching good for consumers? Right, so the question here is, if we have price matching available, right, so if you're able to go to Walmart or something, right, and Walmart says, okay, well, Target has this a dollar cheaper, we can sell it to you for a dollar cheaper, that's no problem, right, and that's unlikely to happen, usually you'll do the opposite, right, but let's say that's the case, right, is that good for consumers? So this is where we can say, okay, these businesses are making this decision, what is the macroeconomic impact of this happening? Are consumers better off with price matching or are they not, right? And these are some of the questions we'll learn to answer with this tool set, right? And that's one of the reasons that we look at current events is because that's going to provide us with the case studies that we need to look at in order to understand and apply what we're doing in classes. So other aspects of strategy that we'll be looking at in less detail are the mathematical, Right? This has to do with things like game theory. Right? Uh, you may have heard more directly like the prisoner's dilemma. Right? That's that's a very basic one, right? This is covered in uh, well the invention of game theory is covered in a movie uh, called I believe A Beautiful Mind. Um, we'll also be looking at and this importantly this almost always involves rivalry. Right? Which is which is an assumption, but often an important one. We'll also be looking at aspects of psychology. What motivations are there for business leaders? Right? Think about it this way. If you get a bonus, if you're if you're a CEO and you get a bonus every time the stock goes up, what are you gonna try to work on? Making the stock go up. Right? That's, you're psychologically driven in your strategy for your company. And that may not be the best thing for your company, but it must be the best thing for you in that case, if you're following it, right? And so, 
We'll be also looking at it from an organizational perspective. So how do companies organize, right? Is it organized where one person makes all the decisions? Is it organized where decisions are spread out? Is it organized where there's management? Is it organized where rules are rigid and there's a lot of red tape, right? And how does that affect how these companies are able to compete? We'll be looking at it from a political science perspective. This is obviously going to be limited to the scope of business, but political science is important and does influence a lot of the macro decisions that companies make. And then we'll be looking at it from an anthropological perspective. And these are kind of in order from most to least anthropological. It's not because there isn't a lot to say about the anthropological or political science perspective on business strategy. It's just that I personally am not as experienced in these fields, and so I have little to add. But we'll be adding over time more people that can talk about these particular perspectives in business and in strategy. Okay, or or just in general, just in general. But the basic tool set we have is going to be very, very popular. Okay, so the reason we focus on the economic is due to a couple of things. It's due to rigor and flexibility. So we're able to apply it to a lot of different situations while also keeping it very close and very discoverable. So if I presented to you my theories and strategy and I presented to you my process of getting there, you would be able to work backwards and understand and see where I made assumptions and where I did it and where I might have made mistakes. And then there's also a great deal of depth and a great deal of knowledge to be learned from that depth. Right? So although it's very good to learn each one on the surface a little bit, the economic aspect provides a great deal of depth that we're able to explore and then apply to different situations. Right. Okay. So, the economic model of strategy The economic model consists of three following pieces, right? There are decision makers, decision makers, right? Which tells us the following. Who are the active players? Right? And you can look at it almost as a game. So who are the people making decisions in this situation? Who are the people with actual input? And who are the people who are fixed? Now we can't account for everything, right? So if we look at a particular situation, we can't say, okay, but what if that and what if this? You can't have too many what ifs. And the reason you can't have too many what ifs is because your complexity gets so big, you end up drawing no conclusions, right? Instead, you need to focus and decide who the active players are in this situation, right? And then understand who you're going to remain fixed, right? Who you're going to say, okay, once we've made this decision, we can now fix us, right? And then open up our other competitors and see what they would do in response, right? But it has to be in a lockstep way. Otherwise, there's going to be too much complexity too quickly, and you won't be able to discern exactly what could happen, right? The next thing is we need to define goals, right? So when we define goals, we talk about, okay, what do you want to accomplish? That's kind of the most depth you know, basic definition of goals, but it's important to define because what do we want to accomplish in our scenario, right? The next thing we want to figure out is, is our goal profit maximizing? Right, so are we looking at the world and saying, okay, how do we maximize profits, right? And if it's not, if it's not pro uh, profit maximizing, is it non-pecuniary? which is just a fancy way of saying, well, it doesn't have to do with money. We're trying to create social good. We're trying to compete with other nations. We're trying to compete for power. We're trying to compete for influence, right? Whatever it is, you need to understand what the goals are because you're going to be tuning your model to succeed at those goals. And you're going to be evaluating different decisions 
to succeed at those goals. The third thing you're going to look at that's important is choices. What choices are available to you, right? So what's in consideration? What's in consideration and what's available, right? What are your strategic variables? What this means is what could influence your considerations? What could influence your strategy along the way? And how are you going to best prepare for that, right? So this is actually an element of luck. Because you're not predicting this, you're just saying this could be a lot of different things. But of the things it could be, how do I position myself so that my variables can come out positive? And then finally, what is your time horizon? Right, because as a famous economist once said, in the long run, we're all dead, right? So, what is the time horizon of what you're going to be trying to achieve? Are you trying to achieve it in one year, in five years, in three days, right? And therefore, what are the decisions that you're going to make? Because that's going to influence your considerations. It's going to influence your strategic variables. And it's going to influence how you do things. So, now that we've learned this, let's go ahead and let's explore a scenario. And this scenario has the following context, right? So we're going to be talking about 5G networks. Now, I've covered this before, but I'll cover it again, just so, you know, everybody's on the same page. But 5G networks, the way 5G networks work is here. Preceding 5G networks, maybe I should stop there, start there, are 4G networks. Right? And 4G networks enabled, the United States was first to get to 4G networks, right? And that enabled us to have things like Instagram and Netflix, right, to grow here, right? Because we were able to dominate this mobile market and have this innovation. Now, this innovation is valued today at $250 billion in revenue. So had we arrived second on the 4G distribution nationwide, we would have lost $250 billion in revenue for the country, right? That would have gone abroad to some other company. Okay, so now what we're looking at is we're looking at a global race, a global race to deploy 5G for 5G deployment, right? And what we're seeing is we're seeing several countries competing Right, namely South Korea, China, and so on and so forth, to deploying 5G, and they actually currently have an advantage. Right? So now we're going to go through our strategy framework and try to identify the different pieces in this. Right? Obviously, if it's bringing in that much money, if it's that important to innovation, it's going to be important to the United States to try to win this race. Right? So who are our active players? Who are our active players? Right? So in this case, we have telecom companies, right? They're active, they're making decisions. We also have regulators. They're also active, right? For our fixed players, we have foreign governments. Foreign governments and their telecom industry, right? So when we evaluate our fixed players, we see that foreign governments inject a large amount into telecom, right? They have a lot more freedoms, or I should say the people lack freedoms, and therefore the telecommunication industry is able to be pushed down people's throats, right? Because they're able to say, well, the government decided we should do this. Here's all the money that you need to do it. We're doing it right now, right? And so these are fixed pieces, right? And right now they have a competitive advantage in overcoming our telecommunications industry and our regulators, or in particular, our government, right? So what are we trying to accomplish? We're trying to accomplish 5G deployment. We're trying to accomplish 5G deployment nationwide. And we're trying to accomplish it first. That's important, because if we were just trying to accomplish 5G, there wouldn't be much to do, we would just wait, right? So we're trying to accomplish it first. 
right? And so we have several competitive choices. Some of them are more ridiculous than others, but we have several choices that we could make, right? We could fund the telecom industry by giving them subsidies, something that we'll likely do to some degree, right? And something that we're already doing to a, lot, to a large degree. We can allow for consolidation, or we can nationalize the project. Right? As a general rule, the United States will not nationalize projects unless it's absolutely necessary and there's no other way. So that leaves us with funding and consolidation. Right? And so the variables that we're going to be looking for that may influence our ability to make these decisions are the following. The budget, which is our government budget, and then public opinion. public opinion, right? Those are going to be two important variables in doing this, right? So if we decide to fund it, the budget may fall through, or the public may decide that that is a terrible thing to be wasting money on, and that won't happen. If we decide to allow consolidation, the budget is no longer a concern. We just have to deal with public opinion, right? So we emerge with allowing consolidation to be the advantage, right? to be our advantageous choice, at least in the choices that we've allowed, right? And so, admittedly, I work this backwards out of them already allowing consolidation, right? But we can see why this competitive decision was made, and a decision to allow consolidation in telecommunications was not an accidental one or a major oversight or anything else it has been looked at. It was actually a strategic choice in order to compete in the global market and global deployment of 5G networks. So that's a way that we can use strategy to better understand what's going on in the world and make sense of what's happening, right? So here's an important thing about strategy. Strategy promises to teach success, right? So we promise to teach success. That's kind of the thing, right? We promise to teach that you can be successful, that you can make successful choices, that there are better choices than others, and how to look for them. Right? So one of the things that doesn't work is that you can't copy success. Right? So there have been numerous books that have looked at, you know, 45 successful companies, 11 successful companies, 35 successful companies, right? And this is what they do. They do A, B, and C, right? These only do A and B. These do D and F, right? Totally off the charts. And here's the reality. For every 45 successful companies, there were probably 4,500 failing companies that did the exact same thing. For every 11, there were 1,100. For every 35, there were 3,500 that did the exact same things but simply fell to the wayside, right? And that's very important to look at because, or it's very important to keep in mind. The reason it's very important to keep in mind is because when you have people studying the 45 successful companies or the 11 successful companies or the 35 successful companies, what you end up with is you end up with a skewed picture. You end up with a skewed picture of success, right? And when you end up with a skewed picture of success, when the success that you're looking for, rather than looking for actual success, you look for companies that are doing A, B, and C, right? What you get is you actually get a proliferation of fraud. Right? And you get a proliferation of fraud because it's much easier to fake these aspects than it is to succeed by doing them. Right? It's much, much easier to fake. So one of the kind of shining examples <coughs> of this kind of attitude was around the early 2000s. Right? So the internet had just kind of gone into full consumer force and Markets were growing and things were getting great, right? Everybody was making money on their stock portfolios. The economy was in full swing, right? And then came Enron. Now, many of you may know about Enron. It's a pretty, it's a pretty popular kind of tale, right? But it was considered the most admired and innovative company of its time, right? the most admired and innovative company at this time. As a matter of fact, people would observe it to understand how to turn around their own companies, how to 
turn around companies, right? How to run their business. Right, consultants are quoted as saying, well, this is how Enron does it. The Enron way, right? And so you should do it in a similar way. And this is a very toxic attitude, right? This observation of success can become very toxic very quickly. So in the August, in August of 2000, in August of 2000, which might seem like forever ago, and it kind of does now that I say it, but in the August of 2000, Enron's shares were worth $90.56 per share. They were at the height of their success. Everyone thought that they were the definition of the new economy, the definition of the future, right? By January 2002, Enron had declared bankruptcy and their shares were worth 67 cents per share, right? They imploded, and they imploded for a lot of reasons, and we'll go over them shortly. But the lesson here is that on paper, they looked like an admired, innovative company, right? That could turn around their business. They knew how to run their business and expand, right? They had the Enron away. They had everything going for them, but they had lied. They had lied, right? So here's some of the ways in which they were able to lie and look extremely successful, right? The first thing that Enron did, so Enron was formed in 1985, 1985, right? After natural gas pipelines, or our story begins in 1985, after natural ga gas pipelines, were deregulated. And what that means is Enron no longer had sole control of the pipeline. And so they needed to go into a new business. Competition was allowed to flourish in that business and they needed to go into a new business, right? So they built a market for trading natural gas. Right? Just like trading any other commodity, you could now trade natural gas, which means you could share, you could excuse me, you can invest, you can buy ahead of time, you can hedge against it, and so on and so forth, right? As part of that process, one of the things they did was they reshaped their culture. They reshaped culture, right? And they reshaped culture by following the example of Wall Street, right? So what do you do? You hire MBAs, you give them long hours, right? And then you tell them you eat what you kill. And this simply means that bonus compensation is based on your performance and how much you make. Now, if you're a Wall Street investor, you probably work in a similar environment. Or do you think that your company is unsuccessful? Probably not. So you're going to look at Enron and you're going to say, well, this is the future, this is what I'm doing, and therefore this is the correct way to do it. Right? They continue to expand. Right? So Enron not only went into the gas market, they moved into other commodities like electricity, they traded electricity. They then moved into coal, steel, and water. And in 1999 and 2000, they introduced, let me get the exact name, the Enron Broadband Initiative. And so this is at the height of the booming internet market, right? It's largely speculated that Enron had no reason to be in the broadband market. They had no advantage to be in the broadband market. But what they were doing is they were piggying back on a trend. People were investing in broadband, so they changed their broadband. We actually saw this recently when cryptocurrencies were exploding, right? 
some people just change their company to cryptocurrency mining or something on the stock exchange cryptocurrency mining on the stock exchange now they could just be a metals mining company but it didn't matter people still bought in right people still bought in and you could just change your company name to whatever the hell you want it doesn't have to represent what you're doing and so As Enron added these businesses, as they continue to emulate success, they continue to take on risk. And no matter how passionate or how well connected or anything you are, you cannot deny the forces of economics. As you take on more risks, you are more likely to fail. This is just the case. As you as you start failing and start taking losses, you better be able to absorb them. If you're unable to absorb them, you will fall apart. And so finally, Enron declared bankruptcy. And then what we now famously know is that they were investigated by the SEC and the Justice Department. SEC and the Justice Department. The SEC stands for the Securities and Exchange Commission. right? And the Justice Department is, well, the Justice Department. So they were investigated by the Justice Department, and it turned out that they were actually just faking their success by messing with their accounting and stretching what was allowed out forward. Now, was every single investor stupid for not checking their accounting? No. They had auditors who had also been complicit in the scheme, right? Was every single person in Enron involved in doing this? No, absolutely not. The big mistake that was made, the biggest mistake that was made is that people assume that what looks like success is success. And that's simply not true. Right? And so, I say that because it's easy to consider success in hindsight. It's easy to pick out a bunch of companies that have already succeeded and say, well, this is why they conceded, right? This is why it worked. This is why it didn't work, right? Enron had this wrong and that company had that wrong and this company did this right. But the reality is you can't always evaluate from hindsight when you're looking at success, right? A lot of times there's a lot of luck involved. There's a lot of complexity that you don't see, right? And there's a lot of small decisions that make a big difference down the line, right? And it's hard to spot these small decisions when the big decision actually comes to fruition. So, ah, this is an important piece, and this is a piece about how we are going to be applying this class. Okay? So strategy promises to teach success. Strategy teaches success. But what it'll give you is it'll give you insights and principles. And what these are are just tools to implement strategy to define strategy and to find it, right? But you must match these principles and insights. You must match them. I've already got it written. You must match them with your conditions. So out of context, principles and insights are not useful. They require conditions. They require context to be correct. And the context is going to be up to you as a manager, as a leader, as an individual. It's going to be up to you to provide that context to business situations. By the way, if you guys have any questions, feel free to put them in the chat. Um, I'm sorry, I didn't realize that made that loud a noise. Feel free to put them in the chat. I do have the chat open. So I will be kind of trucking along here. 
uh, until I see any questions, basically. Okay, so let's move on to the next piece. And the next piece is when you're looking at business strategy, you will see the following that there is a bewildering amount. There is a bewildering amount. Of strategies, right? And so it becomes easy to just say, well, this is mostly luck. And it's not. And it's not. The majority of it, right? It's not all luck. Luck certainly plays a role. But the majority of it is maximizing opportunities through strategy. Maximizing opportunities. And in maximizing opportunities, you don't always go for, say, I decided this is the best outcome, that's what I must do. What you say is, you say there are many possible outcomes and many possible strategies. And what is the best thing that I can do to maximize my opportunity in taking care of those strategies and absorbing them? Right? So that's where you're maximizing strategies. Okay. Now, that brings us to a little aside, which is important to consider, which is how does, at least one of the ways, there are multiple ways, but how does artificial intelligence win at chess, right? And it would be a shame not to mention chess in a class about strategy, but how does artificial intelligence, the most simply trained artificial intelligence, win at chess? It's not by memorizing moves, uh, it's not by memorizing board states, it's not by evaluating every single board decision for the most likely outcome of winning and the most prestigious way to play or whatever it is, it's actually by maximizing choice. Maximizing choice. So what the artificial intelligence does is it tries to make moves that create the most possible future choices regardless of your competitor's decision. Future choices. Why? Because you are always faced with good choices and bad choices. And the more choices you have, the higher probability is that you will have a good choice in the future. The less choices you have, the more likely you are to be stuck with making a bad choice or a bad decision. Right? And so, that's an important way to look at strategy in general, and in particular, at business strategy and maximizing choices and outcomes. So, what is strategy concerned with? What is it concerned with within a company, right? It's not about how you organize your desks, although it might be, right? But it's really about the big decisions. The big decisions. And that's part of what's enticing about this class is we get to look at the big decisions and we get to see and try to figure out if there was better decisions or why those particular decisions were made, right? So what encompasses big decisions, right? The first thing is boundaries. Boundaries are an important piece of big decisions. And the reason boundaries are an important piece is because we cover what should the company do? Right? How big should it be? Right? How big should it allow itself to get? And what business should it be in? Right? So how big is, it, is a definition of scale? Is it an international company? Is it national? Is it based in some local geography? Right? And the different strategies are going to change that. Right? What should it do? Right? Should it try to uh, build the best products or the cheapest products or the most interesting products or only sneakers? Right? And then what business should it be in? Should it be concerned with all lines of shoes or should it only produce sandals? Right? That's an important question. The second thing, or the second big decision that companies look at, is markets and competition.
And this is going to inform a lot of your context for making your decisions, right? Because you can't make decisions out of context, right? So is the nature of the market competitive? Is it competitive, right? If so, how competitive is it and on what aspects, right? And then how do you interact with your competition? Right? So do two people walk into a store and decide which ketchup brand to buy on the shelf? That's your interaction with your competitors in ketchup, right? If you and if you're browsing around websites and you're able to do a search, right? And you're able to just go to another website and do a search there, that's how you interact with your competition, right? Is it being forced down your throats by browsers? Right? Is a browser being forced by your throat by an operating system? Right? Are you choosing based on skill? What, what is your competitive interaction? And how competitive is the market? Right? Is it just you and two other companies? And we'll go into actually why that matters. Because although all markets are competitive in some way, some are more competitive than others. The third thing we look at is position and dynamics. And this is an important piece, right? So position in the dynamics decides our position, right? Importantly, this is a static thing. What is our position, right? Where are we in this market, right? And where do we need to get? Because this informs your literal context at a point of time, right? And then you want to see what is the evolution of this, right? Are you going to continue to compete on price? Right? Are you going to continue to be the number one producer? Are you trying to produce the most or perhaps the most expensive? Right? Are you trying to capture more of the market? So those are your dynamics. Right? What is happening to your position over time and how do you want it to evolve? Right? Because you have to make a decision on the direction in which you're going to push it. Right? Otherwise, it will just be made for you. And then finally, once you've made all those decisions, you look at something called internal organization. And an internal organization, it's actually quite simple. How do you organize? Right? How do you organize your company? Do you decide that there are going to be um, open desks and everything else? Do you decide that the CEO is going to make all the decisions? Are you going to give your employees more responsibility? And we'll talk about we'll talk about some of the different companies and some of the different decisions that have been made and why they made competitive sense and why they ultimately became successful at what they did. So for boundaries, I'd like to go over an example, right? So in boundaries, we can look at Pepsi and we could look at Coke. Two seemingly identical products, right? Aside from the fan base, however, Coke only makes soft drinks. Pepsi, however, makes soft drinks, fast food, and snacks, amongst other products. Right? And here they have defined their boundaries differently. Coke said that we make soft drinks. We're good at making soft drinks and we'll keep making only soft drinks. Whereas Pepsi has said, yeah, we're okay at making soft drinks, but we could also be good at making fast food and snacks. And so their boundaries are going to decide their competitive aspects, right? So when Pepsi acquires another fast food chain and puts only Pepsi products in it, Coke doesn't go out and buy a fast food chain themselves. They go out and try to get another fast food chain to supply only Coke, right? And so that's important in defining your competitive strategy. So the next one in marketing competitive analysis, right? And we'll call that just market and comp, right? In marketing competitive analysis, you have different markets, right? So for example, no matter how saturated pharmaceuticals get, pharmaceuticals get, all the firms, even the smallest, have high profit margins. And you might ask why, and the reason is that they have protection. They have protection from things like patents and so on and so forth, right, from their intellectual property. 
And so they're able to maintain it, right? And although it is a competitive market, it is not competitive at the granular level. And so every company can get a piece, right? The opposite is airlines. Airlines to date have produced about net zero for the economy, right? Not in terms of the goods they deliver, but in terms of them as an industry. So as an industry, they are so intensely competitive that even during the best of times, margins are razor thin. Right? They're unable to make a lot of money because it's such a competitive industry. And what you'll often find, and I remember reading this, I forget the book, but it's a book about startups, but what you'll always find is that companies with low competitive markets will often say, no, 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 you don't understand. Um, we compete a lot. We compete a lot. Right? We're always worried about our competition. Right? And you'll find that companies in very competitive markets will say the opposite. We are unique. We are unique. We are different. Even though in reality, they really aren't, right? And so their marketing messages are going to be a flip and in first version, right? So next time you see Delta Airlines tell you that they're different from every other airline, it's because in reality, they're the same as every other airline. They might have small perks and so on and so forth, but the reality is, their ability to compete in that market depends on you believing that they're different, not on the reality that they're actually different, right? And so we'll always see that. The next thing is positions and dynamic. Positions and dynamics. So here we can talk about a company like Walmart, right? Their position is static. They are a discount retailer. That's it. Everything Walmart does is to stay a good discount retailer. Right? That's their static position. The dynamic of how they bring about this position is by negotiating prices. Negotiating prices. Economies of scale. and different forms of distribution. All of these different things have various impacts, but they all drive their decision to be a discount retailer. Right? So that's the process, their dynamics, in which they stay competitive, in which they stay a discount retail, and how they reinforce that decision over time. And so, given the opportunity to expand into a luxury clothing line, they will not do so unless they can reinforce it and become a discount retailer. At least that's the strategy that they have demonstrated so far, right? This may change if they decide that their position is going to be shifted. But for the time being, their position has not shifted. And then finally, as our last kind of explanation and choice, I want to look at internal organization, right? So this is this follows internal organization, and this has to do with things like goal alignment, goal alignment, decisions, how resources are delegated. Right? All of these things decide the internal organization, they decide the strategy and the ability to implement the strategy, it's how it's done, right? And a great example of this is Walmart, right? So Walmart is a company, oh, excuse me, not Walmart. I just finished talking about Walmart. A great version of this, excuse me, is Whole Foods. Now I can't speak to how true this is since the acquisition of Amazon, although Amazon is known for being relatively hands-off in its acquisitions, right? But Whole Foods is run in a way where every manager has almost complete control over his store, right? The organization itself is what's considered a family organization, right? So people are treated as family, there aren't really formal hierarchical structures, and everyone works together towards the common goal of delivering extremely expensive but extremely high quality food to their customers, 
right? And so that's where their internal organization has a huge amount of, right? So how do you align goals? Do you give, do, they, do the managers get bonuses? No, right? What they say is this is your responsibility. We are all in this together. Our goal is to create something wonderful. So this is an indirect goal, right? How are decisions made? Does he have to call the CEO and his, does he, does the manager of the store have to call his manager, have to call his manager? No, right? As a matter of fact, the employees themselves that stock the shelves can decide where things go and how things go. And so they're able to make decisions, right, at a granular level on the very bottom. And then finally, resources are still distributed in a kind of hierarchical way within the organization, right? In terms of a store employee can't decide to just buy another store and start it himself. The company that handles that piece, right? And we've actually seen companies where, that have even gone a step further and have made resources available as well. And we'll actually look at some of those companies um, and that way of management thinking, right? But that is internal organization. That is internal organization. So, there's one more thing that I wanted to cover here. Ah, okay. So next class, next class, in this topic, we'll be doing a primer on the economics that are needed to understand strategy, right? So not everyone may have covered these economics. Um, I certainly haven't covered all of them in my classes, so we're going to do a primer on the economics that we're going to need to cover these strategies, right? And to try to understand better about what's going on. All right, that concludes our class, business strategy. The last thing that I want to do today is I want to talk about some interesting announcements that I have for the stream, for you guys, and for myself. First, we'll be bringing on a good friend of mine and fellow grad, Tom, who will be working on a special series. We're not sure exactly what it is and how he's going to be doing it, but my assumption is that it will have to do with math, probably at a high level, uh, maybe programming, Tom is a very, very talented programmer and a math major, right? So he will be bringing some of that to our class. Besides that, I'm excited to say that philosophy will also be joining our courses, right, in the near future. We haven't decided exactly when. This will happen probably sometime in two weeks. And I'm meeting with Tom next week, so probably in two weeks. I can expect philosophy probably around that time as well. Um, and then finally, Queens College, which is the university that I work with, I had a meeting with the dean of my department, and then his boss, and then his boss. Um, so all the way up to the provost of the university yesterday. And the decision was made that we will most likely be piloting my style of lecturing live on Twitch or on some platform, presumably Twitch, I'd like to stay with this platform in spring 2019 as an official class at Queens College. Right? And this is pretty exciting. Right? Because my pitch to them was that yes, I know you don't like recorded lectures because people don't work that hard and it's hard to maintain, but live lectures are going to be slightly different because you can answer questions. And so we're going to be piloting this concept live on stream for an actual university. So exciting news and good things happening. Uh, if there are any questions, put them in the chat. Uh, but as far as I know, that's it for today. So I'd like to thank all of you for joining me. Uh, I'd like to thank all of you for watching. Those of you that watch it on YouTube, thank you very much. And if you haven't followed, if you haven't subscribed on YouTube, if, you, if you're not on my Twitter, make sure you get on there and find out exactly when things are happening. We're still ironing out an exact schedule, and we'll get that done over time. But right now, thank you so much for being here. I always appreciate it, and I hope you have a great rest of your day.